And Esquire named Andy one of the 75 most influential people of the 21st century. So please give a warm welcome for Professor Drew Andy. That's, that's much too much. And just to be really straightforward, the exhibit is spectacular. I've never seen anything like it. I'll just echo uh, uh, from my own perspective the thanks to the supporters of this exhibit. Uh, it's important. And um, what I'd like to do in about 10 minutes is not talk about the exhibit, but the context that I experience around this type of work and the exhibit, uh, not to give you answers, but to give you some questions and to share some of the things we're wondering about and struggling with. <laughs> so life, biology as we know it, flourishes on our planet. It's taken over Earth and we see it everywhere. As people, we've interacted with biology in a number of different ways. For example, we grow plants to eat them. And you might recognize the six different plants shown here. Carrots, watermelons, eggplants, bananas, broccoli, and corn. Corn found in nature doesn't come with a cob. These plants were adapted by our ancestors to produce a new type of form that we find easier to eat. Similarly, listen to this. By crossing and breeding plants and animals, we shape their form and properties. By changing environments, we change biology. The deforestation to plant oil palms removes habitat for many creatures to make a commodity product that we sell at very small prices. <clears throat> 36 years ago, uh, Stanford and UCSF helped invent genetic engineering that brought forward the first generation of the biotechnology markets. So we've been designing biology to solve medical, health, agricultural problems. Now what? Where are we today? What's the culture of biotechnology we might shape and wish for? What does it mean to talk about design in biology? What are we going to do with that capacity? And is there a culture of design? Are there schools of design? Is it, is it more than just solving the problem that we can think about right now? Here, for example, is a double-decker suspension bridge grown in place from the roots of a rubber plant in India. It gets stronger over time. It fixes, it fixes carbon as it's manufactured. It's passed down from one generation to the next, who literally inherit its structural elements and maintain them. And it represents some of the amazing things about biology. It's a natural nanotechnology. Photosynthesis is powered by 90 terawatts of energy across the surface of the Earth. Uh, these systems reproduce and grow by themselves. It's massively functional from a material science and chemical perspective. And oh, by the way, if you get better at all at enabling people to access biotechnology or make biology easier to engineer, somebody will freak out for a valid reason. So how do we think about the living ramifications of our technologies? The promise is extraordinary. We actually have enough manufacturing capacity on Earth to provide for all of humanity without trashing the planet. We can transition from living on Earth to living with Earth. We could stabilize and recover natural biodiversity. We could take infectious diseases off the table. You can enable a culture not of consumption, but of citizenship. Biology is everywhere that people are already, so people can have the technology. And oh, by the way, we'll understand a lot more about how life works if we get better at tinkering with it. So these are the promises. The question is, how do you get there? Or how do you reshape what those promises might be? Here is the first class I taught of 16 students back at MIT in 2003. The price of building a gene, a DNA printer that would take information over Ethernet and make the DNA from scratch, I got a low discounted price of $4 a base pair. So I got an $80,000 budget from the government, and that paid for 20,000 base pairs of DNA synthesis. That's since left MIT, it's now iGEM, the International Genetically Engineered Machines Competition. You can think of it like the first robotics competition, but for biotechnology. It has about 4,000 students a year from 40 countries and 300 schools. Oh, by the way, the price of DNA synthesis has dropped from $4 a base pair to $0.04 cents a base pair. And these students are now empowered with the equivalent of about a million dollars worth of free DNA synthesis budget every year. 
If you haven't seen iGEM and you happen to be in Boston in the fall, you should go check this out. It's amazing. But it doesn't scale to everywhere. So again, think about what can happen here in San Jose. Meanwhile, what's going on with first-gen biotech economically? Here's a representation of the genetically engineered domestic product in the United States. So the economic revenues from deploying recombinant DNA. And it's about $350 billion a year domestically into three categories of products. Medicines like recombinant insulin for treating diabetes, industrial enzymes for doing chemical transformations, and food with some controversy that I'll come back to. But note that it continues to grow. And in this context, we're deploying much more powerful tools for engineering living matter. So we anticipate this is effectively the tip of an iceberg. Most of what you see when it's deployed industrially is to make what I would consider to be important but boring things. Here are brewer's yeast engineered to make an oil or a fuel ingredient. The yeast are the gray blue things and the blobs of oil. Well, that's what the yeast are making instead of a beer or a wine. That's great, but when you deploy biotechnology to make bulk commodity products, it doesn't necessarily interface super well with nature. So the sailing pavilion for the Beijing Olympics, suffering from agricultural runoff, those nutrients uh, creating blooms in the water. And if you talk to folks who are on the front lines of conservation biology and biodiversity, it's not obvious how we're gonna slot in a full biomanufacturing economy on our planet without figuring out how to rebalance our relationship with the wild. So John Hoekstra and colleagues at World Wildlife note that 24% of the surface of the earth that's capable of growing plants, only 24% that's left is wild or not under significant human cultivation. If I try to make all of humanity's stuff through bio-based manufacturing as opposed to petroleum-based old biology, what's that gonna do? Am I gonna shift that to the left? Naively, that's what's happening. I'd really like to shift it to the right. But to do that, I can't just industrialize biology. I have to biologize industry. I have to remake the interfaces around manufacturing. So I just wanna close by helping you, uh, help me to think about living in the future. So imagine what I call the nerd rapture. Every possible technology I could ever wish for to work with with my students and the uh, visitors to this exhibit, it all exists all the knowledge of life and how it works, we have that too. So the nerd rapture has occurred. What do we want? What do we wish to be true about ourselves and the planet? Well, I'll start with incremental steps and then go a little bit far out. So last year at Stanford, my wife and her team were the first in the world to take yeast and make an opiate. Typically it's sourced from a poppy plant but instead you can feed a batch of yeast sugar and they'll make the same molecules. And this caused a fair amount of controversy because of the massive problems in public health around overdosing related to prescriptions of opioids. That's now a company. The goal of the company is twofold. Let's make painkillers that aren't addictive by taking advantage of our capacity to reprogram the biochemistry inside a more tractable organism, yeast as opposed to a plant. But let's also think about solving the other problem. Two billion people on Earth have access to painkillers, five and a half billion people don't. So maybe we could use the capacity to distribute manufacturing in a way to do something a little bit different. Oh, by the way, you might notice everybody in this photo is a woman. That's only because they're the best people in the world working on these types of projects. Huh, how do we get everybody to access biotechnology? Let me step a little bit forward more into the future. On the top here is something you'll see in the exhibit, bacteria that have been programmed to make pigments. Now E. coli, if you look at it, it's a dull brown or tan color, just like you would expect. But these students in Cambridge, England, as part of iGEM, made what they call E. chromi, seven different pigments. You can make bacteria that are red or purple or green. What would you do with living pigments or living paints? They didn't know, but their insight was to recognize they didn't know. And so they went to the Royal College of Art, to the designers at the RCA, and commissioned them to partner with them and say, if you had living pigments, what might people wish for? And that's shown at the bottom. They called this idea the scatalog. The idea is you take a probiotic yogurt. The bacteria in the yogurt have been instrumented with genetically encoded sensors that detect your disease state as presented through your gut. And depending on what immune system markers are high or low, 
if you're okay, nothing is activated. But if things are out of balance, a particular color will be formed, and that will come out of you, indicating which specialist you should go see. So you have a living probiotic medical diagnostic platform. And it sounds strange and funny, and they recognize that, so it's hard to see. But on the bottom left of this slide, they put the numbers 2049. Now, that's not the price of the, the kit or the yogurt. It's not $20.49. That was the year they thought humanity, our culture, would be ready for this product. In 2049, people will be comfortable drinking probiotic yogurt that's a medical diagnostic. Think about global public health for a second, though. This is a technology platform that is capable of making more copies of itself, and yogurt's capable of being made in many places, including places where you couldn't get a colonoscopy, or if you could get it, you couldn't afford it, and so on and so forth. And you could go beyond just actuating colors for diagnostics. You could have these organisms make things to do in situ treatment as well over time. Or most of all, now let's go further into the future. Remember when this product was introduced, and it was an amazing introduction. It says, today we're introducing three new products, a telephone, a web browser, and a music player. Now let's imagine a future where Apple or some future company makes a personal DNA synthesizer that allows people with objects like this to print DNA from scratch, right where they are. Biology is already there. It's aquatic chemistry. You should be able to do it technically. So we'll call it the iDNA for now, or the MyDNA. And today we're introducing three revolutionary new products. You can download the code and make your medicines right where you are. You can store your memories in synthetic DNA that encodes bits that go into an abiotic data storage tape. Why would I give my wife, when I'm trying to convince her to marry me, um, a stupid piece of dumb carbon that has no love or information in it, we could store all the beautiful photographs and poems and letters in the DNA and compress that into a piece of jewelry, and I could make that myself. And it'd be the perfect backup copy for all my kids' photos and stuff like that. And I want that, absolutely. And oh, by the way, you know, learning through biology, learning to program computers, we're gonna learn, you know, we hear about Minecraft, you'll see the, the MycoWorks uh, studio in here, MycoCraft, building with mushroom blocks. I think you're gonna wanna have your kids obviously learn in their own house with programmable biology. So everybody's gonna want one of these MyDNAs, right? Don't know, but think about it. If that came true, and we had tamed, which we're going to, these types of organisms, things that grow on sugar like e yeast, things that grow on sunlight like the algae and the mosses, things that grow on methane that comes from PG&E, Right? Imagine if we give people kits to program from scratch all these main manufacturing organisms. People could make a lot more locally. You could do distributed manufacturing in really incredible ways. So for example, um, you know, PG&E is selling for 99 cent download off a website the DNA code to make your food. You make your food by feeding a reactor in your kitchen natural gas. And the microbes eat that and make stuff. Right? Or Google Life Sciences, has a download which is that probiotic yogurt that diagnoses what's going on in your gut. Or Samsung has a download which is a DNA code you make and that grows your cell phone in a modified mushroom. That's a free download so long as you get the subscription plan, right? So you think a little bit about what could happen if you let people download DNA code where they are, which you can do over the internet, but make the DNA locally and then make with that by reprogramming the biology. It's a very different uh, uh, set of transactions. All right, so let me close with uh, a few uh, puzzles. I love this stuff. There's nice smoothies here this morning. They're really, really tasty. In the bioengineering building, I can get these drinks, and uh, they're great. But when I read these bottles, I can't ignore something. This is the ingredients list, right? really easy to understand. Here's the ingredients list again, if you're a nutritionist. And then here's the last side of the bottle. No GMO. I have no problem with that. I hate the idea of modified organisms. I don't want to eat something modified. Who would want that? I mean that. I kind of like engineered organisms. Um, okay. But then the small text, I'll just read it out loud, is really strange and I can't ignore it. It says, if a bioengineered version of an ingredient exists, we're not gonna use it. Well, I'm in the bioengineering department. So this is like, I'm drinking this in the bioengineering building and they're against what we are. So I've thought a lot about this and I don't have 
um, any perfect answer to the puzzle of how different cultures intersect around biotechnologies, but I'll leave you with a couple uh, comments. This is a video, of, a very important video, it might be hard to see, but it's a video of rabbits in nature. And just look, yeah, there they are. So as an engineer, I grew up in Pennsylvania. I'm a civil engineer by training. I went to school at Lehigh when Bethlehem Steel was still going. I worked for Amtrak. And as so I really am happy when I make stuff. And when I got into biology, I got into biology because biology is the best manufacturing platform on earth. We're just not yet very good at making stuff with it. We're getting a lot better. And so I always explained to myself and to my family and friends that I was drawn into this because of the utility of biotechnology. And my colleagues in biotechnology, we tend to be overdriven by the pressing problems we can solve with biotechnology, the curing of the disease right away. But the problem is that leads to a culture which is very short-sighted and not totally mature. And so there's a different way to think about culture, which is the culture of play. Not frivolity, but just play, as if you might be a toddler and doing something and having fun and learning by that experience. And these rabbits, the animals in nature that play, suggest that play predates culture. And so one of the things I want to leave you with is just a thought, is maybe we've rushed to deploy biotechnology and haven't totally backfilled all of the dimensions of culture we might wish for. Similarly, if you remember the painting from Sargent that I used at the beginning of the talk, I wouldn't go to that painting with any of you and expect that we will both have the same opinion of the painting. But if I was to get into a conversation with somebody on a biotechnology project, for some reason, we'd think we should have the same opinion. It doesn't make sense. So it seems like our culture of biotechnology is still quite immature. And then one last thing to ponder. This is from the designer at the RCA who came up with the probiotic colored yogurts. As we make living matter fully designable, fully engineerable, which it now looks like we'll pull off over the coming decades, one reaction is to imagine nothing changes. And all the forces in our society select for that, for the status quo. But the reality is many things are going to change. And so we have to learn how to talk about that. We have to learn how to enable a culture of citizenship of biotechnology, not merely consumption. And we have to wrestle with how we deploy biotechnology in ways that allow both ourselves and the planet to flourish together. Thanks very much. I hope that gives you some stuff to think about. The exhibit's amazing. Congratulations to the team.